time. Um, we appreciate your attendance. And um, again, it looks like we have a nice full house. So we really appreciate you all taking time to join us. Um, so as San Francisco, the nation and the world really um, emerge from this pandemic, people are really eager to rediscover their neighborhoods and also discover the, the community leaders that keep it thriving. And now's the time to celebrate um, the organizations and people that helped us, and especially San Francisco, where um, commuters and uh, visitors, tourists are not coming back in the numbers that they were coming. So it's really important that residents get to rediscover their city. So the City by the Bay is known as a beacon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we are proud to be working with our community partners at Square to celebrate our neighborhoods and our community leaders today. So thank you for joining us. This is the fifth in the sixth uh, form, highlighting uh, some of the official cultural districts of San Francisco. So today's forum is focused on the leather and LGBTQ cultural district here in San Francisco. Um, that's right in the heart of San Francisco. Um, and remember to stay till the end because we'll be announcing gift certificate winners to the local businesses, to some local businesses in the district as well. So stay tuned for that. In this program, we'll hear from um, local leaders uh, who will give us a high level picture of the special neighborhood and the role their organizations are playing in preserving and promoting the district. So uh, let's get started. My name is Vaskineris. I am a small business advocate. Uh, I actually was born in Greece and I grew up in my father's uh, grocery stores and the Mission and the Excelsior, uh, studied architecture, landscape, and um, that didn't work for me, but I started a small business uh, and small businesses are great. They allow you to express your, you know, uh, your entrepreneurial skills, your cultural skills. And, and that's why I learned the value of small businesses and especially how they contribute to the local economy and also to our culture as well. And recently I closed it to form this agency is called NexSF and we create private public partnerships to promote small business, uh, neighborhood corridor. And these days we need to promote uh, San Francisco values uh, because San Francisco is really a beacon for the rest of the world uh, for what we represent uh, culturally. So today's program is, um, uh, we wanna welcome you to our leather and LGBTQ forum, which has been sponsored by Square. By the way, uh, the boundaries of the district are 7th Street to Division and Howard to Brandon. Uh, there are actually uh, eight cultural districts in San Francisco, soon to be nine. And a cultural district is a geographic area within San Francisco that embodies a unique heritage and receives financial support from San Francisco. Um, each district is defined by its residents and cultural and historical contributions to the city. For example, these uh, districts may have locally owned businesses, music venues, colorful murals, and festivals which define a cultural district. So before we begin our program, we have a few housekeeping rules. Um, if you miss something or wanna share it, um, wait for the follow-up thank you email from us. And remember to, um, if you do share this program on your social media, please tag the organizations that are represented here today. So it's been over two years. You all, you're all experts on these Zoom platforms. If you have a question, um, please drop your question in the Q&A section up above and we'll ask the question to all the panelists or any panelists that, um, that you identify, we'll ask the question at the end, uh, at the end of the presentation. So um, again, we encourage everyone to tweet and repost our forum and use the social media handles represented here today. So please sit back, enjoy your favorite beverage and let's start with the program. Um, unfortunately, our, our uh, our uh, Martin Guerrero from Square. He's the community affairs and small business advocate at Square. He's not able to join us today, but we do wanna thank Martin for his continued support. We've been doing these programs now with him for almost uh, two years. So we really wanna thank Square for being a good community partner. So before we begin with the uh, panelists, uh, we'd like to present a video montage of the district. So take it away, Dr.
love it. That should whet your appetites to go visit the district. Lots is happening. Um, this is the first, uh, the first um, leather uh, LGBTQ cultural district, official cultural district in the world. Um, it's another feather in the cap for San Francisco. So um, we have so much to discuss. Our first uh, panelist or um, uh, person here uh, is Shane Watson. Shane is an award-winning architectural historian specializing in LGBTQ history and San Francisco. So welcome to the stage, Shane. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, I am Shane Watson with uh, Watson Heritage Consulting. I'm an architectural historian and a, a sole practitioner based in the San Francisco Bay Area, so a super small business. Um, you're probably wondering what an architectural historian is doing for the world's first leather and LGBTQ cultural district. So I'll tell you why I'm here. Um, as a historian, I've spent a little over a decade specializing in the history of LGBTQ communities in San Francisco and studying the neighborhoods, buildings, and landscapes where those histories um, unfolded. And a little, little over five years ago, I co-authored a report for the City of San Francisco's Planning Department on the history of LGBTQ communities in the city from essentially the Native American period through the, the AIDS epidemic. Um, and that is being used by the San Francisco Planning Department to make decisions about the buildings throughout the city where um, you know, these histories took place. And then in addition to that, I've over the last couple of years, I've been a co-chair with Terry Beswick um, on the Arts and Culture Culture Committee for the City of San Francisco's LGBTQ plus citywide cultural heritage strategy. And this actually goes in front of the Board of Supervisors for the first time on July 25th. Um, so these rec those recommendations that you can read about if you if you search for that report, um, essentially talk about how what what we, what can we do to sustain and stabilize um, what the city really values at, at, in its um, LGBTQ culture and heritage. So definitely follow that progress. Um, so having a leg in both worlds of LGBTQ history and historic preservation is what led me to the leather district. Um, cultural districts are still sort of a newish thing in San Francisco and the leather district formed just a couple of years ago. And one of the requirements the city has for these districts is that they prepare a three year strategic plan that is aimed at fulfilling each of the district's visions and goals. And those visions and goals are derived from, you know, a very, very robust community engagement and outreach program. Um, so these reports that are called the, we call them the CHESS report because they're the cultural history, housing and economic sustainability strategy reports. Um, the goals that are outlined in those plans are sort of used as a roadmap um, for how to stabilize the living cultures that still, you know, very much like exist and play in these communities. Um, how do we prevent gentrification? How do we prevent loss of, you know, culture to other areas because of cost of living, etc. So um, I was hired by the board of the Leather District to help with the cultural history of the neighborhood. Um, which has essentially been documented and writ written by district founder and cultural anthropologist Gail Rubin. Um, this district, the Leather District, benefits from having its own expert who's also a resident of the district and a board member who, who's very, um, Gail is very much involved in everything related to the district. But Gail has been researching the histories of sexual subcommunities in San Francisco since the late 1970s. And so a great summary of her work is in an article titled, The Miracle Mile, uh, South of Market and Gay Male Leather, 1962 to 1997. And that's online through foundsf.org. So one of the requirements of the cultural district legislation is that um, the districts are responsible for documenting, preserving, and interpreting the buildings within their boundaries, um, specifically the significant historic buildings and landscapes. So Gail and I, working with board 
then board president, um, now uh, executive director, Bob Goldfarb. Um, we essentially surveyed the entire district um, you know, using a lot of the documentation, the history developed by Gail, but also additional documentation through the GLBT Historical Society, which is the nation's largest LGBTQ archives and it's based in San Francisco. So, you know, looking at which buildings played an important role in development of leather in San Francisco and, you know, also so many other layers of LGBTQ history unfolded in South of Market. Um, we've been able to create a sort of database that the district is using to develop walking tours. Um, the city of San Francisco's planning department is can use that data, this building by building data to make decisions about what happens to these buildings if someone proposes demolition. Um, and then property owners can use the data to even propose landmarking for their buildings, which is, um, you know, there are myriad benefits that come with that. So I'll end with a quick kind of historical, of two historical, um, facts or sites, LGBTQ landmarks in South of Market that um, Gail would want me to draw attention to, I think. So the first leather bar, or yeah, the first leather bar in San Francisco actually opened in the Tenderloin. Um, it was called the Why Not, it was on Ellis Street, it opened in 1962. Um, the second leather bar opened in South of Market, it, that opened in 1962 same year as the Why Not, but um, at the corner of 4th and Harrison. And that bar was called the Toolbox. And that bar essentially kind of set the scene for leather in South Market in San Francisco, and then, you know, subsequently the world. Um, and then I just want to quickly uh, quote Gail. She notes, the Toolbox was a sensation, wildly popular, and even attracted nationwide media attention. In 1964, and this is really notable, um, Life Magazine did a story on homosexuality in America and a photograph of the toolbox was spread across the two opening pages of the article. And um, one of the most celebrated features of the bar was a mural by local artist Chuck Arnett, um, whose paintings and posters were featured also at other bars in the neighborhood, the Ambush, the Red Star Saloon. But this mural was a massive black and white painting depicting a variety of um, as Gail says, tough looking masculine men. Um, unfortunately, the toolbox was torn down for redevelopment in 1971, like so much of the rich cultural legacies destroyed in the South of Market to make way for um, the Moscone Center, among other places. But one incredible queer landmark in South of Market that still exists and you can visit today is at 83 6th Street. And in 1966, this building became what we understand to be the nation's first gay community center. Um, there was an organization called the Society for Individual Rights, uh, which was an early homophile group, um, but they opened shop there in 1966 and that became the country's first gay community center. So go check that out, local landmark. That's amazing. Thank you, Shane, for the overview. Um, because you know, San Francisco is such a dynamic city, it's always changing, but I always say, you know, we always say, if we don't know our history, we don't know where we're going, right? We need to take pause, note, acknowledge, and then we can move forward. So um, thank you again for presenting. Um, our next panelist is uh, Jonathan Ohinaga. Uh, he's actually a small business owner. He owns uh, Asuka Lounge um, in the district. And he's also a uh, director at the Cultural District as well. So welcome, uh, Jonathan. Tell us about yourself and uh, your business and the businesses that exist in the district. Thanks, Fas. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ohinaga, and I am the owner and operator of Asukar Lounge. We've, uh, we've been down here in Soma for just about 11 years now. Um, sometimes it seems like an eternity, and other times it seems like we just opened yesterday. <laughs> um, we. Uh, Asukar is a uh, is definitely a, an active community participant. Uh, we try to uh, to present basically uh, Mexican culture, like taste of Mexico, a taste of Mexico, uh, to everyone who kind of comes through our door. So you're not going to find like kind of the the kitschy like uh, 
typical like you know little knockoff chain uh, Mexican stuff when you come into our place. It's uh, it's it's very much like you're coming into a friend's home. Um, we have sofas and coffee tables so that it, it's kind of a warm and comfortable environment, not necessarily a cookie cutter restaurant environment. We, uh, we have uh, a very, very vast assortment of agave distillates, um, over 300. Um, and now in uh, Mexico, starting to export some really amazing whiskeys and rum. So those are some things that we're starting to feature as well. In addition to, of course, um, authentic food and some food that you know is, is more kind of geared towards palates in San Francisco. So not necessarily authentic, but would definitely taste of Mexico. Um, gosh, in terms of small businesses, the, the, the district is such an amazing place because there are so many just amazing kind of things happening in the neighborhood. Everything from Japanese restaurants, Thai restaurants, coffee shops, um, leather shops. Uh, there's there's going to be a, a, one of the coffee stores down the street from Azucar uh, is called um, Cafe Suspiro, and uh, they uh, the manager just actually acquired it from uh, from the previous owner, and they're going to be they're undergoing kind of a soft opening right now, but they're going to go through a, a grand opening in uh, in August, and they're they're bringing uh, of course amazing coffee, and then uh, records and books and some other kind of things to the neighborhood. So it's uh, it's really amazing to just kind of see the the vibrancy of the neighborhood, and uh, and even as, as things have been kind of tough for the last couple of years, there is kind of uh, increase in traffic happening and people are starting to come into some of the vacant storefronts. So there's, there's lots going on. Um, in terms of, uh, of just general things kind of going on in the neighborhood, um, some of my favorite things to, to do are, I, I visit Cafe Suspiro almost every day. And if I don't go there, I go down the street, there's, a, there's an amazing little coffee shop uh, that is uh, really focused on their baked goods. It's called Telescope Coffee. They're down on uh, on Ninth and uh, what is that Harrison in between Harrison and Bryant. Um, they make everything in house. They have uh, just it's such an amazing selection of of pastries, ho homemade pastries and coffees and stuff. Um, and then up the street from us, there's uh, there's Asia SF, uh, who's been in the neighborhood for oh my gosh, if I had to guess, at least twenty to thirty years. Uh, mainstay of the neighborhood. They're definitely kind of uh, a destination place that have been an anchor for the for the district and the neighborhood for many 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 years. Um, they were they were closed for the most part during COVID. Uh, they were undergoing some some seismic retrofitting, but um, they've kind of freshened up the whole place and it looks amazing. And I'm really really excited about getting back in there. Um, I love that they uh, when you go in there they they brand themselves as uh, gender illusionists, which I think is is super cool. Um, and the food's amazing too. <laughs> so if you're uh, if you're in the neighborhood, definitely come on out and and visit any one of the the small businesses, Sukar, HSF, Cafe Suspiro. Um, gosh, there's just so many things going on down here. Excellent. Thank you so much. You know, um, people know HSF, but how how would you describe HSF? Because that's such an iconic, not only San Francisco legacy small business now they have an outpost in palm springs as well right yeah they, yeah they they so, opened up that uh that outpost in palm springs right prior to uh to COVID, i believe like 2018 maybe 2019 um their uh, their location in palm springs i have yet to visit but it's definitely high up on my list they have a whole outdoor area it's a it's a huge space from what i understand um hsf is uh um it's uh it's gender illusionist so they they have uh, it's kind of like a dinner and cabaret show they typically have a prefix menu. Every time I've gone, I've done a, a prefix. So you pay one admission fee and you get uh, a prefix of, you know, three to five things, depending on what package you pick. Um, they have a full bar. They provide entertainment. It's just such a, a, it's a fun place to go. We've had our our staff outings there a few times <laughs> and it's always just such a great time. And downstairs they have, uh, it's a split level building uh, or venue. So downstairs they have a, a nightclub where they, uh, they feature uh, kind of nightlife events down there as well. Wonderful. You know, um, I just got a text from one of the viewers, actually. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes I get texts um, um, asking, what are some of the iconic leather businesses uh, that have been a mainstay of the district? Um, wow. There's, a, there's quite a few, uh, quite a few that are, are around. Um, the first one that comes to mind, just in terms of like bars specifically, would be Lone Star, uh, which is down on Harrison Street. Um, I love Lone Star. They have the, the little outdoor patio that's heated. Um, they, they do a bunch of events as well. 
Um, closer to Asukar would be uh, Hole in the Wall and, um, and Powerhouse. Those are definitely two, two longtime businesses uh, that are definitely kind of anchors for the, for the nightlife and leather district. Um, and then of course the Eagle uh, down uh, kind of closer to Costco on uh, the newly formed Eagle Plaza and uh, it's kind of near division in, what is that, Harrison? Yeah. That's right, excellent. Those are great, those are great spots. And I know far off in the distance, we were thinking of some sort of like a cultural small business walking tour of the district as well. Um, Cause I think that's a great way to highlight the businesses and because um, your district is very special. It's not just one street with all these stores on them. Yeah. You know, you really have to wander the, the streets and there's different places. So um, you know, there's other cultural would... districts in the city that are like that too. I think that would be a great idea. I know during um, during the time when uh, when we were struggling to kind of get people into the neighborhood uh, with all the restrictions and stuff, there were a couple of events that, that we did as a district that kind of highlighted some of the businesses in the neighborhood. And it was really great to see just people out and about um, kind of participating and you know, exploring the neighborhood. I love it, I love it. Yeah. And it's uh, activity that's um, activity rich. So there's yes, all kinds of very things. Much so. Daytime, very nighttime, much. it's the whole range. Mm -hmm. um, so next up, we have my new friend, uh, Bob Goldfarb. He is a longtime community leader. He's actually the executive director of the Le Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District as well. So welcome aboard. Tell us, who is Bob? You're such an icon. <laughs> the work that you do and uh, what are your wishes for the district? Uh, I am Bob Goldfarb. I have lived here for 24 and a half years, not that I'm counting. And uh, it's, uh, I have been uh, very active in the leather community here for a very long time. Uh, I used to be the, um, uh, the president of the Folsom Street Fair and Up Your Alley Fair uh, organization. And uh, I've been volunteering in the leather community um, for since, since I moved here uh, 24 years ago. And I was also uh, the program director for the Leatherman's Discussion Group. I'm currently the uh, chair of the Young Leatherman's Discussion Group and have uh, been active in the community for um, a very long time, including the time before I moved here. Uh, probably for about five years before I actually moved, I was spending seven to 10 days a month here. And uh, one time I was connecting, connecting flights and all of the fun people were going down one concourse to the San Francisco flight. And I was going down another concourse to the San Diego flight with one other person. And I decided I was getting on the wrong plane. And uh, anyway, and I, uh, I got my place to live here six weeks later. So uh, anyway, that, that is my, my origin story, if you will. Uh, I became uh, involved in the uh, cultural district uh, in uh, the fall of 2017 and uh, worked to get the legislation through the supervisors uh, and to the mayor's office. Uh, establishing the geography of the district and then worked with the grassroots organization uh, to get our bylaws established and get us established as the um, managing organization for the for the district. Uh, anyway, uh, it has certainly been an uh, interesting few years and uh, I have transitioned from board president to executive director uh, when our uh, fiscal sponsor decided I was volunteering too many hours not to get paid. So anyway, um, the, uh, I'm listed as talking about uh, advocacy. And so the question is, you know, what are we advocating for? Which I think takes a little bit of a look at the district. Uh, in the summer of 1980, uh, there were more than 40 leather and LGBTQ businesses in the district. Uh, we now count 12, uh, and we've lost a couple um, during the pandemic as well. And so we are advocating um, for space for our businesses, our entertainment venues, uh, and those sorts of things with the rapid development that's happening in so south of market. 
a lot of the industrial spaces and large uh, open spaces that uh, have been used historically for our entertainment venues uh, are being turned into residences and that have uh, very little commercial space. And so uh, we, we are advocating, we work with developers when a new development goes in uh, to help the developer come up with ideas to help mitigate the gentrification that occurs from bringing in uh, all these new residents and uh, displacing these uh, industrial spaces. And we, we do that, we ask them to do several things. Um, if they are going to have a uh, retail space, we uh, hope they will give us uh, uh, premium rates uh, or, or um, discounted rates uh, on uh, some of the retail space uh, for our local businesses. Uh, we do ask them as well to uh, put in an addendum to their lease explaining that the uh, new residents are moving into a cultural district and there are things in the neighborhood such as the Folsom Street Fair, the Upper Your Alley Fair, uh, and they may see things on those days and perhaps in between uh, that you might not see in North Beach or Pacific Heights. And so we hope that helps educate the, uh, the new residents and uh, to develop a long-term copacetic relationship between the new residents and existing businesses and events. The, uh, in addition, uh, businesses who are interested in coming into the district, uh, we advocate with them, with the Entertainment Commission, with the Office of uh, Economic and Workforce Development, with the Planning Department, uh, to help them get the permits that they need. Uh, there have been uh, some interest in establishing bathhouses in the district. Uh, and the, there was no, um, uh, in, a, in a practical sense, there was no way to actually have one in the district uh, due to zoning issues. And uh, we helped them navigate uh, the, the city um, uh, processes and permits. Uh, ultimately, uh, new legislation was established uh, that now effectively allows bathhouses to be created uh, in the uh, cultural district, uh, which until uh, about six months ago was not possible. Uh, so we're, we're constantly working with, um, you know, with businesses, with developers, with the city to, um, you know, make it easier for businesses and for our culture to thrive in SOMA. Uh, we, we don't know if we can get back to uh, 40 leather and LGBTQ businesses in SOMA. Uh, we, we are optimistic we can um, increase the numbers from the current 12. Uh, we're establishing an entrepreneurship program uh, to help establish businesses uh, in the district uh, that uh, serve our community. And the, as far as advocacy goes, um, one of the things that's very important is making the district look and feel like a place. So when you are in Soma, uh, in the Leather District, you, you know you are in the Leather District. We are advocating with uh, the city uh, for the myriad of departments uh, that it takes to uh, put up uh, placemaking and public art features. Uh, we're currently working on a project to establish pole banners. You've probably seen on the white poles, there are twin uh, banners on either side uh, with uh, various and sundry um, you know, businesses, educational institutions. And we are working on a project to establish those in the district. Uh, we're also working on getting uh, leather pride flags um, uh, on all of the light posts. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we've also been working on uh, mural projects. Uh, we have a mural uh, up that went up recently on Oasis, which is quite large and uh, is making a very large visual impact on the neighborhood. Uh, we have several other planned, which we hope to execute over the course of the next year. Uh, and there are also things such as uh, Ringgold Alley, which has a history installation, 
with uh, bronze plaques in the sidewalk, uh, as well as standing stones to commemorate businesses and organizations and people that are no longer with us. Uh, there is also the Eagle Plaza, uh, which someone mentioned earlier, which we believe has uh, the largest constantly flying leather pride flag in the world. Uh, the flagpole is 80 feet tall. It's visible from the freeway and uh, many areas around the city. And uh, the mayor has even mentioned it in one of her presentations that uh, when she sees the leather pride flag coming home from the airport on the freeway, she feels like she's come home. So those are some of the things uh, that we advocate for and uh, we're trying to do to keep the Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District uh, vibrant in SOMA. Uh, keep the businesses and the people, the artists, the performers, uh, we, we are here to see that they all continue. Bob, I love it. You're a poet. <laughs> I love it. I love the overview because a lot of the things that you touched on, it they're not just specific to the leather district. They're they're applicable to all cultural districts all across the city. And at the end of the day, culture is something that's not replicable by any other city in the world. And um, this is part of our cultural economic identity that we have here in San Francisco. And um, it's actually exportable because now there's a wholesome Europe fair in Berlin. And I know we were talking about it with Cal and I think it's called Folsom Strass and something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and but these I are touch they, points. They, they, they actually just call it uh, Folsom Europe, but uh, they have just added uh, Folsom in Australia, which they're calling Folsom Down Under. Amazing, amazing. I mean, how beautiful is that? you know, culture, it's such a nebulous, you know, it's ever changing, you know, culture, it, 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 we wanna preserve culture, but it should not be in a vacuum because you wanna allow it to develop and grow. And um, I really appreciate what the cultural districts are doing. And at least in South of Market on Saturday night, it's not so nebulous. <laughs> Correct, Correct. And, and we love that. Uh, so with that, we're going to go to the fun part of the district now. <laughs> <laughs> My new friend, Cal Callahan, he is uh, the cultural district manager. He's also a longtime San Francisco Bay Area resident. And um, he's going to tell us all the fun things that the district is doing because there's events, daytime and nighttime, and for all ages. So uh, take it away, Cal. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Cal Callahan. I am the district manager. Uh, as Vass uh, referred, I moved to San Francisco in 1983. So I'm going on 40 years uh, as a Bay Area resident. I'm actually located in Oakland now. And I, as you could probably tell from the timing, I got here just before the beginning of the AIDS crisis and uh, was really swept up in volunteering and later uh, ended up working in nonprofits for 25 years. Um, mostly in the HIV and AIDS field. Um, and it was, that was also related to how I became involved with the leather community. You know, back in, back in my day, I, I was more likely to be found in a disco than I, than I was in a leather bar. But um, during the AIDS days, it was primarily the leather and lesbian communities that stepped up for the, you know, for the, the gay men who were getting sick and dying. And, you know, the, the leather community were throwing fundraisers at bars. You know, uh, they started off as rent parties and uh, eventually became AIDS Emergency Fund, which is now part of PRC. So uh, that was kind of my journey into the leather community was, you know, seeing how it was a community. It was a community that gathered to, to help not just their own, but others as well. Um, and that's, that was the type of community that I wanted to be a part of. Um, as you said, I, I get to do the fun stuff for the district, you know, kind of run the parties. Uh, we are very fortunate that there are other groups associated with SOMA that, that are very much aligned with us. So we do a lot of work with Folsom Street. We do a lot of work with SOMA West Community Benefit District. Uh, and, and Bob referred to the, I think it's a 2,700 square foot mural on Oasis. 
that we partnered with uh, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence as well as Oasis to get done with five local queer artists. Uh, so that that placemaking kind of you know moves over into the community building activities. You know, back uh, in the in the spring of uh, 2021, when things were just beginning to open up, but only for outdoor events, uh, we we started Soma Second Saturdays, and that's I know you you you've been to uh, the the latest one this past Saturday, and uh, it was really a way for people to to get together safely in community, but we also want to provide the local uh, leather artists, artisans and craftspeople who had been denied you know, a revenue market for nearly two years uh, to have a place where they could actually sell. Uh, you, know, and we, you know, we did this kind of on the cheap because we didn't want to have to charge a lot for the boots. Um, you know, as long as we cover costs, we're, we're fine. Um, but we wanted to bring that to the community. And uh, it, we went on, we did a couple of indoor events during the winter to tie this over and keep the name out there. Uh, and it's come back bigger than ever. Uh, we, our vendor list for the August event is almost full already. So, you know, yeah, so um, it, the word is out about some of the second Saturdays. Um, what's really exciting, this is, wasn't particularly our project, but we coordinated with the CBD. Uh, this Saturday, there'll be a, a weekly farmer's market uh, in Eagle Plaza. And once a month, uh, that will be followed by the Soma Second Saturday. Uh, the other big piece that, you know, that we'll be working on, uh, this last fall, we brought back Leather Walk, which had been an uh, AIDS emergency fund uh, fundraiser that, you know, fell by the wayside just before COVID. And uh, we gained the rights to that and brought it back. We had 200, and 200, 200 to 250 participants um, wending their way from City Hall through the streets of Soma, stopping at the local businesses. I, you know, John mentioned something about, you know, have, bringing people out to the streets, and that was exactly what this was for. Uh, so we kind of inundated them, each one of them, for 15 minutes, and then moved on, you know, to a party culminating in Eagle Plaza, uh, hosted by the Eagle Bar. Uh, we're, we're doing that again. Uh, the date is September 18th. Please mark that and please join us. Uh, we'll be gathering at City Hall at 11 a.m. Uh, still working on the route. I, I may be making some changes, um, but those those are things. We, uh, we'll also be participating uh, in adopting a block of Folsom uh, between 8th and 9th uh, for the Sunday Streets event uh, hosted by Livable City on Sunday, August 21st. So lot, lots of ways for you to come visit us. Thank you, Cal, really appreciate it. And thank you for your years of commitment to the community. Um, I was not aware of that, so thank you. Um, what are some of the social media handles that people can follow so they can be abreast of events, events, you know, different communities? Uh, most of them are uh, at SF Leather Dist. So just the, just the first syllable district. Okay. and. And you're on true. Instagram, you're on Twitter, you're... I have, we have a Facebook page, yeah. Right, All the other and, 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 and Fat Life. And, and what is that? Fat Life. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will or will sure. not go into as much detail as you want on that. <laughs> you know, we, we dropped some of the handles in the, in the chat section. So, um, Great. Thank you. and then we'll make sure to send the the links and the follow-up thank you email as well. So lots are going on. A lot of things are happening. Um, but I just want to thank you all for um, your participation in the conversation. Um, we are going to get to the Q&A section um, in just a few minutes, but we have a few winners to announce. So let me get to my list. So I let's see, let's see. There is a virtual drum roll here. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got uh, Jerry Roberts and Austin Langley and also uh, Marilyn Mahoney as well. So uh, you will be uh, getting um, certificates to some of the local businesses in the area. Uh, one of them will be from Asuga, from our friend Jonathan's business. Uh, the other one for, will be from uh, Cafe Suspiro. Um, that's on Folsom Street. 
And the third one will be from Driftwood on Folsom as well. That's a great place too. So um, thank you all. Uh, we're gonna get to the Q&A section now. Um, so I have a, uh, I just got a question from one of our attendees. Let's talk about um, venturing into the district. Uh, give us during the day, a perfect day in the district. <laughs> And then we could talk about the night as well. So um, if someone were to come to your district, what would be some of the places you recommend for them to go to, like starting in the daytime and then going into the nighttime? So uh, Cal, you start. Okay, um, John brought up a few of them. I'm, I was trying to take notes to see which ones I could add on to that. Uh, I think I would start early on uh, at Wicked Grounds for coffee and, and, a, and a nosh, um, and maybe buy some gear there, um, then move basically kitty corner across the street to leather, et cetera, you know, get, you know, get a few items there and then do the serious leather shopping at Mr. S right down the street. Those are all, all along the 8th Street corridor. Um, shopping makes me hungry. I'd probably go visit John at a zoo car for lunch. Um, you know, and, and maybe hit a happy hour at uh, Powerhouse or Eagle are usually my go-tos. You know, and you know that evening, uh, catch a drag show at Oasis. I think that would be kind of my perfect day in, in the district. Wonderful. And uh, we just got a question from um, a statement from um, my friend Andrew. Uh, this this weekend is the first um, farmers market. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us about that. What can people expect, and what are the hours, and what what are the um, what street is it going to be on? Yeah, it's it's on 12th Street, uh, basically within Eagle Plaza, so uh, Harrison North to a small street that most people don't know called Bernice. Uh, it'll be about a, a dozen vendors. I'm not uh, last meeting I was in, they hadn't quite uh, nailed down all of them. Some will be prepared food, some will be produce. Uh, and uh, the hours are 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Saturday, uh, except for when second Saturdays, uh, second Saturdays occur, because then they'll be closing early 1230 or so, because we also set up in that same area. Love it. Thank you. We'll, we'll be sure to attend. So I'm going to ask the same question to Shane, and maybe from your perspective, like, how can people experience, uh, you know, the district from a historical architectural point of view? Well, I think they they would start with. Um, we were just talking about this earlier. The district is developing a walking tour of historic sites. Um, I don't. I can't speak to the latest and greatest on that. So maybe Cal or Bob can weigh in. Um, but that would be a great place to start in terms of landmarks. Totally, totally. Because, you know, a place is made up of buildings, of people, of culture, businesses. So it'd be great to uh, stitch all these elements together because they really add to the, to the whole picture. Yeah, I think um, one thing I would just say quickly about the history of South of Market and especially LGBTQ and leather histories is their... Out of all the neighborhoods in San Francisco, I would say South of Market is my favorite historic LGBTQ enclave because of the many layers of histories that um, unfolded there. So, so the earliest homophile groups in the city, like the earliest gay rights organizations that coalesced in the 1950s had their headquarters in South of Market on mission. Um, the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Belitis both had their offices there. And then almost every important newspaper or magazine ever published related to this community was published somewhere in the South of Market. Um, and then, you know, the, the layer of leather history and kink histories and all of these different sexual subcommunities. Um, so it hits on everything from politics to LGBTQ rights to, you know, sexual um, rights of people to be able to do what they want sexually in terms of um, publications and publicly. And so it's just such an extraordinary history. So I hope that the walking tour, Bob, is going to come together at some point. <laughs> We're working on it. 
<laughs> and uh, anyway, we've, we've just got someone uh, uh, on board recently who uh, has experience with walking tours. And so we're hoping to accelerate that process. And, you know, on the walking tour, in addition to things like, you know, the Eagle and some of these venues, uh, we actually have quite a lot of interesting architecture. And there, there's sort of a combination of uh, early 1900s, um, you know, post-earthquake industrial architecture, because it was, it was very, very industrial, uh, even up into the 60s. And uh, Shane mentioned printers, and there were, you know, they made coffee. There, there were just all of these very sort of industrial businesses. There were, I believe, packing, meat packing plants. And... Uh, the, the gym that I uh, used to go to before the pandemic uh, was an auto uh, factory at one point. And if you look at the buildings themselves, the sort of earlier buildings, a lot of them have these little sort of peaked um, fronts on them with, with brick facades and sort of the, the next generation, there's actually a fair bit of art deco industrial architecture. And so you'll see a lot of buildings with these curved fronts that go into the doors and the little sort of art deco details on the, on the vertical portions. And, you know, much more modern than all of that is of course Ringgold Alley, uh, which has a lot of history and relates to a lot of our, our history. And so uh, if, you are, if you are near Mr. S, it's basically across the street. Uh, and so definitely worth a, uh, a walk down the alley and on the 8th Street end, uh, there is a stone, uh, well, well, there is a plinth uh, that has a little bit uh, about the district and a picture of the mural that Shane was describing uh, earlier at the toolbox. That's amazing. Amazing. Incredible. And the district is constantly changing as well. Um, Jonathan, let, I'm going to ask the same question to you. What would be a perfect day for you, like to experience a district morning to night? So perfect day for me would be, um, I'm not an early riser just because my schedule tends to kind of go a little bit later. So I'm usually getting morning coffee when everyone is doing lunch. <laughs> uh, but I would, uh, I'd start out doing morning coffee at um, either Cafe Suspiro, Wicked Grounds, Telescope, any of the, the local places. I definitely try to funnel, um, anytime I'm going out, I definitely try to funnel any of my, my patronage to businesses in the neighborhood. Um, I just kind of think it's important to kind of support the community. So um, I would go uh, to any one of those places first and then um, maybe sushi across the street, maybe, uh, maybe down to 11th or 12th street and visit someone for food down in that direction. Um, Willows, uh, basil Thai cantina. Um, yeah, those are the, those are the, the food places. Definitely. If I was going to go out shopping, um, I'd run down the street to either Mr. S or to leather, et cetera. Um, or hopefully soon the, uh, the record shop at uh, cafe suspiro, hopefully after August, uh, a new little place to, to go check out. Um, and then, uh, I definitely would do a, a happy hour. Um, I tend to kind of stay close because we are, it is such a small business and I'm the owner operator. I don't have a GM or anything. So I'm kind of always on call. So if I'm ever going out, I, I always need to be sort of close in case I need to come back because we get busy. So I, uh, I would probably either go to Powerhouse to grab a cocktail or, uh, or Hole in the Wall. Uh, those tend to be my, my frequent, frequent visits just because it is so close. And if I do need to come back to help out, it's a two minute quick jog away. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm, I've been taking lots of notes. So hopefully the audience is going <laughs> to do all these things. Bob, uh, I know you touched on so much, your wealth of knowledge. Uh, tell us your perfect day in the district. Well, I'm with John. My perfect day starts about one o'clock. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, you know, I think my perfect day, I would probably start shopping at Mr. S. Uh, and, uh, you know, spend some time, uh, maybe grab a coffee or something and spend some time uh, on Ringgold Alley. Uh, there are a few places to sit uh, sort of in the middle of the alley. And uh, so it's relatively quiet. Uh, nice place, nice place to just relax, check your messages, 
that sort of thing. And uh, I would probably, as, uh, as the day got later, uh, I would probably swing by Oasis for a show and uh, dinner before that or after that, uh, Menorah's Thai or Basil Canteen uh, are restaurants I have um, spent a lot of time at. And uh, I would probably wrap up the, wrap up the day at, uh, at the Eagle. And uh, anyway, and uh, on, the, on my way out, just take one last look at the, uh, the, the leather pride flag on the, on the way home. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful picture. Um, <clears throat> very nice. Um, and Cal, I just want to go back to, I know uh, Sunday Streets is coming to Soma. Do you know the dates for that? Yeah, August 21st. August 21st. And do you know um, like the, the boundaries, the length, like where it's? Yeah, the whole thing is from 9th Street, so we're the westernmost end of it, um, through Yerba Buena to Spear Street. So it ends in East Tuck. Great. Yeah, know, and how be... is the district participating in the Soma Sunday Streets? Um, well, Yerba Buena is bringing the, uh, the kid-friendly uh, activities, uh, and we're going to be spewing much more in the adult direction. Uh, so uh, we'll be, we're going to kind of pay, you know, ease people into that so they can decide when and where they want to turn around if, not, if necessary. Um, but we, we are adopting uh, the block between 8th and 9th, so the very westernmost, as our hub. Um, we probably are going to overflow a little bit onto the other side of 9th. Of 8th, I'm sorry. 8th and 9th on uh, Folsom, or what street? Yeah, 8th and 9th on Folsom. Got it, got it. Long, okay, it, cool. It, yeah, it's a long Folsom for the whole length of the, of the event. Yeah. And that's another reason for people to come to explore the area, add the Sunday streets, and then explore the district as well. Exactly. That's the idea. That's what we want to do. So guys, we need to wrap this up. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's I've learned so much. And I think um, a lot of people want to learn so much about what makes San Francisco, or our beloved San Francisco tick. Uh, thank you again for doing this. Uh, it's been a great discussion and um, all good things must come to an end. And as you can see, San, it's appropriate that the Phoenix is a symbol of San Francisco. It's, it's coming back loud and strong. There's a lot of naysayers out there, but we know we're special and we're doing a great job. Uh, we're doing our whatever we can to keep it going and make sure other people know that we're doing this as well. So mark your calendars. Uh, Soma Sunday Streets is coming up. The Farmer's Market is this weekend as well. It's going to be every, uh, every uh, Saturday until October, I think. That's correct. And, right. you know, and, and again, we will overlap once a month with the, with the Soma Second Saturdays. You know, the next one will be April 9th. Uh, August 9th. Yeah, and and um, again, it's uh, Eagle Plaza, right? That's, that's where... Yeah. Uh, the Second uh, Saturday actually goes all the way from Harrison to Folsom. So it's, it's okay. lined with vendors for that whole stretch. Right. Well, listen, thank you. And that's why we've been highlighting these cultural assets, small businesses in these districts, in these unique neighborhoods, because they're really beacons of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So again, thank you. I want to wish everyone a great afternoon. Go uh, revisit some of your favorite haunts in the district and also uh, learn and uh, patronize our businesses and our cultural districts as well. So until we meet again next time.